What's going on, you guys? Welcome to Southern Traditions on the Southern Draw Podcast. This is uh, Friday the 13th on uh, September 13th, 2024. What better day to start our Freaky Friday se- segments of the Southern Draw Podcast? So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to be looking at a couple of videos here today and just, uh, well, basically hearing out the message in these videos and and uh, talking a little bit about them as we go. Uh, hope you guys are going to enjoy this little segment. I really love digging into this kind of stuff where we just talk about uh, random conspiracies and ghost stories and um, all kinds of things like that. Today we're going to be looking at some of the evil, evil stuff going on around the world. So we're going to jump right into that right now. And uh, yeah, so stay tuned right here on the Southern Draw Podcast. So, guys, this first video uh, is by a guy. uh, He's got a channel called Mike Joyful Exile. It's a this is a channel talk. It's a Christian based channel talking about the God and the Bible, and also all the evil stuff going on in the world, and maybe why some of this is happening, how some of this is happening. He put together a pretty crazy video here that is called. If you think demons aren't real, watch this. Guys, well, I can certainly tell you uh, just a just a, a, a few minutes on the internet will absolutely confirm that demons are absolutely real and they are working hard in today's world. And we're going to see some of that right now. So sit back and uh, if you've got any, any opinions on these videos, if there's anything you... Uh, uh, anything you want to chime in on, just let me know in the comments how you're feeling, and we'll get back to you on these things. We'll be happy to discuss them with you. This is If You Think Demons Aren't Real, watch this. And also, this guy's got a really great channel, uh, Mike Joyful Exile. That's the name of the channel. Uh, you can see it right here at the bottom of the bottom left of your screen. Um, I would highly recommend subscribing to his channel. I've been uh, scrolling through some of his videos and checking out some of his content and it's some really good stuff. We're going to look at a second video here in just a little bit. Also, uh, a really great channel. It's called uh, Off the Curb Ministries. I, I really like the message this guy delivers, but we'll get into that one in a little bit. First off, uh, let's see what Mike has to say here. Christianity is the most mocked religion. Like we, we want to look at religions with uh, respect and dignity. About new life. About. Don't mock God. Yeah, don't mock God. Sometimes people who mock God immediately experience the consequences of their rebellion against the God they think will never judge or punish them for their rebellion against him. Let's take a look at seven times people who mocked God experienced shocking consequences, progressing to the most shocking one at the end that will make anyone think twice before mocking God in such a way. At the 2015 Brit Awards, while singing her song Living for Love, surrounded by these men wearing devil horns and dressed like demons, amid a demonic red backdrop, Madonna was mocking God as she has a habit of doing when she suddenly tripped and fell off the stage. After the incident, Madonna said this in an interview, explaining the injury she experienced. The thing is I had a little bit of a whiplash and and, uh, I smacked the back of my head, so there was a man standing over me with a flashlight to about three. I think she smacked her head a long, long, long time ago, guys. This woman has been absolutely living her entire 
life, her entire music career, celebrity career, uh, standing for sin and and evil. So the fact that this is only God's only smacked her down one time is pretty pretty incredible. But uh, but very interesting story here because she was in the process in this particular moment of mocking God, which you're gonna you know which has become a common thing for celebrities, by the way. Um, here recently, especially to mock God, outright mock God, but not only mock God to blatantly, uh, show their, their support for Satan and, and for, uh, this devil worship and stuff that that's going on in the world. I mean, it's the most, it's so very, very prominent today. And they're pushing this on the masses. You, you know, it's, uh, it's gotten just over the top with, uh, the the imagery with all this satanic imagery and just about everything that you see on TV, on your advertisements, on uh, just it's everywhere. It's all over the place. So uh, pray for this world, man. 3 a.m. Making yeah. sure that I was still copus mentis. And uh, presumably. And I'm not clearly because I couldn't remember the words of my song. The universe was, I don't know, trying to teach me a lesson, okay. I guess. She also said in another interview, I didn't hurt my butt, I hurt my head. Whether or not this was a coincidence, we can be certain that unless Madonna repents of mocking God, she will face God's terrible judgment on the last day. The word of God should be a constant reminder and lesson to her that God not only exists, but will judge all who remain in rebellion to his commands. In addition to this incident, Madonna has blatantly mocked God and Christianity numerous other times as well. In a Vanity Fair cover photo, Madonna was portrayed as the Virgin Mary, as well as in a blasphemous recreation of the Last Supper, where Madonna was portrayed as Jesus with 12. We just saw this similar imagery during the Olympics this year. Uh, the Paris Olympics, absolutely disgusting uh, mockery of, of God in the Last Supper of Jesus Christ. I mean, just awful awful things that they do nowadays to to blaspheme the name of Jesus, to blaspheme, essentially to uh, persecute Christians. And, you know, you'd never see them pulling the same stunt for Muslims or for any other, uh, any of the other faiths, especially not Islam. You just wouldn't see this. You wouldn't see this kind of thing. Female disciples around her. The images were extremely... It's pretty amazing that they're so willing to outright mock and blaspheme the name of the holy true creator god the the god the the god of gods the lord of lords the king of kings the one that is going to judge them mocking of the Christian Truly. faith and were described as Just. demonic, satanic, and sickening. Another incident where Madonna shamelessly mocked God was during a performance of her song Live to Tell, where she is shown on a mirrored cross wearing a crown of thorns. Madonna and others like her may laugh and mock God right now, but unless they repent and turn to faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, they will not be laughing when they inevitably die and meet their maker. We should expect this kind of worldly and anti-Christian behavior from someone like Madonna. But the world was caught completely off guard when megachurch pastor T.D. Jakes, one of the most famous and prominent Christians in the world, experienced the devastating consequences of his friendship with rapper P. Diddy. Here's a video clip of T.D. Jakes celebrating with P. Diddy on P. Diddy's birthday. <laughs> Of course, P. Diddy is known for an extremely immoral lifestyle, so it was strange that a supposedly Christian pastor like T.D. Jakes would be celebrating with P. Diddy instead of calling him to repentance and communicating the gospel of sin, repentance, and salvation to him. Sometime after this, some people began accusing Jakes of inappropriate behavior at P. Diddy's birthday parties, which led to a firestorm of controversy. Here's Cat Williams commenting on the situation in an interview that went mega viral. It's all catching hell in 2024. It's up for all of them. It don't matter if you Diddy or whoever you is tg jakes any of them the all, every all lies will be exposed yeah cat williams is calling it all out these days man I, if y'all haven't listened to him and some of the things he's been talking about he's got a lot of truth to tell and uh he does not care about these super elites he doesn't care about this cabal and uh, the illuminati he's just telling their secrets telling the truth about them all calling them out for their corruption, for their evil, for their disgustingness, and just putting it all out there, man. I I, uh, I got to say, I respect old Cat Williams a great deal. I hope you keep doing what you're doing, and I hope you stay safe while you do it.
And here's how T.D. Jakes responded to these allegations against him. Some of you logged in or come in out of concern. Some of you come in to hear what I'm going to say. All of you who expect me to address a lie, you can log off. I will not use this sacred day and this sacred pulpit to address a lie when I have a chance to preach a truth. I will stand straight up, head up, back straight, and preach the unadulterated and fallible word of God. Because that is what the pulpit is for. But there will be a time. <laughs> So you can stop dragging people and arguing with people and fighting and just log off. All you do is just hit the button right there. Log off. There is no show here. The worst that could happen if, it, if, if everything was true. All I got to do is repent sincerely from my heart. There's enough power in the blood to cover all kinds of sin. And in an even more surprising turn of events, Jake's yeah, was even named... So in just to address what our pastor here said, yes... The blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sins, but it does not also does not give you the go ahead to just keep on sinning, Pastor. It is not a license to sin. The blood of Christ should transform your life away from sin. So even if it's true, I can just pray to my pray in my heart then and it'll be forgiven. I mean You're, yeah, there's, ah, man, you need to look inwardly on that one, friend. Because I think that uh, if it is true and that's your take, well, I can go ahead and do this because, you know, I'll just ask for forgiveness later. It doesn't quite work that way. That's not the point. And, and it makes you question, too, if if your goal is to just commit sin and I'll just pray for forgiveness later, is the prayer that you pray later actually going to be a heartfelt? Is it actually going to be from the heart in such a way that God will hear it or that God will acknowledge it as repentance? I don't know. There's, uh, yeah, there's, I think you should pray about that one, Pastor. A lawsuit against P. Diddy regarding several crimes as someone who might help rehabilitate P. Diddy's public image. And really quickly, if you want to support this channel and help spread biblical truth to more people, I would be so grateful if you would click that subscribe button. I don't know the details of or the truth about whether Jake's actually engaged in any inappropriate behavior or immoral behavior at P. Diddy's parties. But what we do know is that Jake's essentially mocked and tested God by prioritizing his friendship with P. Diddy and this world over and above being faithful in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world which involves teaching about sin and the need for people who are in rebellion against God to repent of their sin and turn to faith alone in Jesus Christ alone to be saved. But while T.D. Jakes suffered damage to his reputation, Deontay Wilder suffered even more than that when he unashamedly mocked the Christian God in a pregame interview with Tyson Fury, whom he would be boxing against very soon. Hey, Fred, yeah, because you're I told a you a long time ago, I'm going to baptize you. Yeah, well, let's see if you and can I'm baptize show you every, I'm going to put the spirit you inside of you. 100%. I don't want to show you how it feels. You claim, I don't want. It's going to be your God, God against spirit, my God. Time and time again. It's going to be your God against my God. Famous last words. When Deontay Wilder actually fought Tyson Fury in the boxing ring, here's what ended up happening. For strength. Fury up. throwing that up. When Deontay was KO'd by Tyson Fury, he had been the heavyweight champion of the world, a title which he lost after that fight. Now, I don't really know the details of Tyson Fury's Christian faith, and I don't really think that it's right to believe that faith in Jesus is meant to help people win boxing matches. But it remains absolutely true that when the God of the Bible is pitted against any other so-called God, the God of the Bible will always win because there is only one true God, and that is the God of the scriptures. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty on Amen, his robe brother. and on his thigh. He has a name written, King That's of Kings the God that I serve. and Lord of Lords. That's my Jesus. That's, my That's Jesus. the God whom I serve. Not the sissified Christ that's preached in pulpits around the United States of America. Yeah, this uh, fair, this fairy tale Jesus that, that, that twinkles about sprinkling uh, fairy dust on people. Yeah, no, nah, I don't buy into that. I don't, I don't, this uh, Matt Chandler calls him this Fabio Jesus, Pastor Matt Chandler. I love the way he tells that one. Fabio Jesus is not 
that that is not the Jesus that I serve. I don't know where that came from, but the way this man, I'm going to run that back. This is the God of the Bible. This is Jesus that's coming back soon. This is the Jesus that I worship and serve, and I am so thankful. He is a warrior. He is a strong, mighty king, and he needs to be acknowledged as such. These people take him so lightly and think they can mock and, and, and make fun of and make light of. Mm -mm. You do not know what you are messing with. You do not know what you are messing with. Let's hear that one more time. Tell it, Pastor. Out of the scriptures. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty Amen. on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's my Jesus. That's the God whom I serve. Not the sissified Christ that's, that's preached Jesus. in pulpits around yes. the United States of America. Dante Wilder may have experienced the truth of God's victory over his enemies in a physical way in his fight against Tyson Fury. But this is also a spiritual truth that anyone who mocks God and is an enemy of God should absolutely keep in mind before continuing their battle against the creator God of the universe. Christ the Redeemer is a statue of Jesus Christ in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The statue is 30 meters high and the arms stretch 28 meters wide. You would think that a country that builds this kind of a statue would honor the Lord Jesus Christ. But sadly, Brazil has demonstrated that it is happy to endorse blatant mocking of Jesus Christ. During Taylor Swift's Eras Tour, Brazil chose to illuminate the Christ the Redeemer statue with a message welcoming Taylor Swift to the country by putting a Taylor Swift-inspired t-shirt on the Jesus statue, instead of communicating the true message of Jesus Christ, which is to communicate the reality of sin and the need to repent of sin and turn towards faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, Brazil chose to blatantly mock this message. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what, we're going to do a whole video on Taylor Swift before long, because uh, there's something up with her. I got. I liked her music for a while. I, mean, I was not a Swifty or anything, but uh, but I thought she had enjoyable music, fun to listen to. She's uh, got a quirky little way about her that's that's enjoyable to listen to. Her songs are kind of catchy, poppy, catchy. But man, she's a, she's outright practicing witchcraft on stage these days. Devil worship, satanic imagery on everything and, and the, the thing is she most of her fans are, are young kids young teenagers impressionable minds and this is a message she puts out she runs around with uh devils and demons man this girl is she's bad news man bad bad news We're, we'll do a whole story on taylor soon yeah message by even using a statue of Jesus Christ to promote a worldly and sexually immoral music artist like Taylor Swift. And exactly. in 2023, there was a carnival in the heart of Rio de Janeiro where a segment of participants engaged in what can only be described as Satan worship. This segment involved revelers dressing in black and red costumes, some wearing devil horns and carrying pitchforks, and displays of satanic symbols such as inverted crosses. Now, this may have been a complete coincidence, or it may have been God sending a warning to the nation of Brazil, but in 2023, a photographer captured an incredible image of the exact moment lightning struck the Christ the Redeemer statue, which seems to symbolize that this statue has become more a symbol of mockery towards Jesus Christ than a symbol of worship towards him. Another thing to note is that regardless of whether Brazil mocked or worshipped Jesus Christ, this statue really should not have been built in the first place because it's a violation of the second commandment against creating images of Jesus Christ. Pictures of Jesus are a violation of the second commandment. So I tell everybody to get rid of pictures of Jesus because I don't want people violating the second commandment. The lightning struck strike on the Christ the Redeemer statue is quite literally a shocking warning against mocking Jesus Christ. But these next two stories of people who mocked God are even more dead serious, literally. Allah'ın gazabından kurtulamayacaksınız. Hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Hassan Bitmez, a former member of the Turkish parliament, suffered a heart attack immediately after warning Israel of Allah's wrath. He died at a hospital in Ankara two days after the heart attack. Whether or not what Bitmez experienced was merely a coincidence or not, we do know at least two things. One, we know that it's a grave sin to take the Lord's name in vain. And Bitmez... So, right quick, the uh, second commandment, the second commandment says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not 
bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So, yeah, I guess there's needs to be some thought into those images that we uh, see all over the place. These, I guess that goes for crosses and, and images of Christ himself, as well as all kinds of other things. People worship things of the world as well, make carved images of animals and, and, and nature and all kinds of things that they call their gods or worship as gods, make idols out of. So things to keep in mind. As invoking the name of Allah against any group of people, including the Israelites, is an offense against God that will be punished and judged unless repented of and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Two, we know that God is sovereign, so really nothing that happens in this world is really a coincidence. In his With that being said, we don't worship the cross. We, we shouldn't be worshiping anything of that nature. We should not be bowing down and serving or worshiping any idol of any sort. Now, some of us that carry a cross or we see crosses at churches or on churches. I think these things are just symbolic of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Now we don't worship that cross. And if you do find yourself worshiping that cross, as a matter of fact, I remember we were, uh, we were in church once and one of the pastors told me, so we had this big cross on the stage. It was probably 10, 12 feet tall. It was actually made by, by some local, somebody local to our church and they had donated it to, to the church. It was big, beautiful wooden cross. And it was on the stage of the church for, for uh, quite a long time, the, fr the front stage. And, uh, and by quite a long time, I mean a couple of years, this thing was kind of a, a, a piece of the, the stage. And when they redecorated one year, they removed the cross. They didn't remove, they just put it away and, and had put up some other decor, including other crosses, smaller crosses. But the, uh, there were people that got very angry about this, and and it kind of brought to the to light this idea that these people had clung to that cross, that particular. I mean, all it's just wood. It's just a piece of wood. It's not what we're here to serve and worship. So we've got to be careful about where, how, how much, uh, how much, I guess, meaning or. or Devotion we put into things of this world. Uh, the cross is a beautiful reminder of what the actual living God did for us. But it's not something that we worship, not the cross itself. His 20-minute speech, Bitmez says, even if you escape the torment of history, you will not be able to escape the wrath of God. But what Bitmez did not realize was that the only way to escape the wrath of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. And his God, Allah, can't save anyone from the wrath of God. Everyone who mocks God to the day of their death will suffer eternal judgment after they die. And it just so happened that Hassan Bitmez's life was cut short immediately after his blasphemy against God, which should be a reminder to all that mocking God may have deadly consequences, which is exactly what another man named Tancred Neves experienced. Tancredo Neves was elected president of Brazil in 1985, and during his presidential campaign, he said that if he got 500,000 votes from his party, not even God would be able to remove him from the presidency. This wow. is a brazenly bold, bold and rebellious attitude to take towards the God of the universe, and it seems that God chose to take Neves up on his challenge. Neves did indeed get the 500 votes he needed to win the election, but in a shockingly deadly turn of events, he fell sick a day before he was made the president and died a few weeks later. The story oh. of Tancredo Neves Neves is yet another reminder that mocking God will, one way or another, result in deadly and irrevocable consequences. Judas is scary. Wow, so he says, not even God, not even God can keep me from this. If you elect me, not even God can keep me out of office. Homeboy didn't even make it to all. They elected you. You didn't even make it to office, boy. Oh, man. Power of God, man. Do not tend me. You know, that reminds me, actually, Joe Biden just recently was asked to take it or told he needed to step down. He needed, and he said, if God himself comes down and tells me to step down, I'll step aside, but not until then. Well, what was it like a week later? Well, I'd like to talk to Joe. Did you, did you meet God? Did he, did he come and talk to you or who is your God? Who did tell you to step down that you listened to? That's an interesting, 
Interesting, but very similar, very similar event here. Joe Biden said, "Not if God tells me, I'd, I'd step aside." But then he stepped aside. So I don't know. Maybe he had a coming to Jesus moment. Maybe maybe God spoke to him in a dream. Who knows? I I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, we should. Yeah, you don't, don't tempt. Do not tempt the Lord thy God, man. Don't do it. It's bad, bad business. Have faith. You should fear God. And today there's no fear of God in anybody's eyes. It's crazy. No fear in their eyes, man. Yeah, one of the 12 apostles committed an unparalleled act of betrayal and mockery against Jesus Christ. Motivated by greed, he struck a deal with the chief priests, agreeing to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, a deed which was foretold by Jesus at the Last Supper in Matthew 26, 15. He identified Jesus to the arresting soldiers with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane, an act of betrayal highlighted by Jesus' question in Luke 22, 48. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Overcome with remorse after seeing Jesus condemned, Judas attempted to return the silver, confessing his sin of betraying the innocent blood, Matthew 27, 3 through 5. The chief priests dismissed his guilt, leading Judas to hang himself in despair. His death fulfilled another scripture depicting his tragic end in Acts 1, 18, where his body burst open. Judas' story stands as a grim caution against betrayal and treating Jesus with mockery and the dire consequences of greed and treachery. We live in a culture filled with people who brazenly mock the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think there will be any consequences for this kind of behavior. And supposedly Christian leaders in the Christian church are at least somewhat to blame for this because they teach a Jesus who lacks power, who is only ever love all the time, and who will not return to reign and establish judgment upon the world. Here is Joel Osteen teaching people that Jesus has already forgiven their sins, even if they have not yet repented and put their faith in Jesus. The good news is not that God will forgive you. The good news is he has already forgiven you. Like John declared, the Lamb of God has taken away the sin of the world. Now, this sacrifice won't do you any good if you don't receive it. If you go around guilty, condemned, him, trying to pay God back for your mistakes. No, the price has already been paid. Receive his mercy. Receive his love. Every day, Father, thank you that I am forgiven. The problem with this theology is that people who have not yet repented of sin and trusted in Jesus Christ have actually not yet been forgiven of sin and remain as enemies of God who are under the wrath of God. Joel Osteen and so many other supposedly Christian pastors like him teach a weak and powerless Jesus who begs people to come to him rather than a Jesus who is Lord over the universe and who will return as a mighty judge. But I despise the picture that's painted in our culture of this sissified, needy Jesus. Amen? And that's who he is. He's a sissified, needy Jesus. He's just yearning for you. He's longing for you. He wants friendship and relationship with you. He needs you. Oh, you're breaking his heart. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He does, oh man, he does all that for his namesake. He is holy. He is righteous. Not us. Come on, man. People miss the message. He doesn't need you. He's not sitting up there in heaven just lonely wishing he had a friend. Come on, you guys. That is a that is a disgusting image the world tries to paint of our Jesus. No, he's going to break you. Jesus is not yeah, at all a sappy person who only wants love and friendship with people, as is often portrayed in supposedly Christian pulpits around the world today. It's this version of Jesus that people in the culture are so happy to mock and belittle, because this is the Jesus who will not judge and punish people for their sins and rebellion against an infinitely holy and righteous God. Watch what Joyce Meyer says about God's unconditional love, which has an element of truth to it, but is also missing something extremely important. We must believe that God loves us, loves us perfectly, and unconditionally. Here's the thing, God doesn't know how to do anything else because he is love. It's the only reaction he knows how to have. So whether you like it or not, God loves you. Joyce Meyer says that love is the only reaction God knows how to have, but that's just wrong. The Bible teaches very clearly that God is also a God of wrath and judgment, that God will punish all sin and rebellion against him on the last day. God is not a God who is begging and yearning for people to choose him and a relationship with him. No, God is a sovereign God, the Alpha and the Omega, and God will both save all of his beloved people and punish all of his enemies with terrifying wrath. Someone had to drink the cup of God's wrath. It is though with one hand God is holding back his justice against this world and with another hand he is pleading for men to come but one day both hands will be dropped. You know that don't you? That pastor right there that's a man by the name of Paul Washer you should check him out he's fantastic. 
If you have not yet bowed your knee to Jesus Christ and come to know him as your Lord and Savior, there is still time to repent and escape the wrath to come. And if you do turn to Jesus Christ today, know that there is an eternity of joy that awaits you as a child of God who adopts his beloved people into his perfect family. The subject is still justification by faith alone in Christ alone, but the terms are profoundly rich as we come to understand the doctrine of adoption, what it means to no longer be a slave, but to be a son. The doctrine of adoption is one of the most precious of all Christian doctrines. Surrounding the reality of salvation, you have the doctrine of regeneration. You have the doctrine of justification. You have the doctrine of conversion. You have the doctrine of union. You have this is a pastor by the name of John MacArthur. He is a phenomenal pastor. He teaches almost in a kind of college professor type uh, style of preaching the word. Um, some people say he's he's too over the top with the way he preaches. I don't I don't believe there is such a thing. Um, but uh, yeah, also a great pastor to to listen to. The doctrine of sanctification. But you also have this wonderful doctrine of adoption. Hi, my name is Mike. I'm a deacon, a husband, a father, a software engineer, and an amateur maker of videos. So Thank you so Mike. much for watching uh, this video. If you, you want to help me in out my mission channel. to spread... He is, uh, he's doing a great job here putting these videos together. He's got a bunch of good ones on here. Uh, Mike Joyful Exile. I'll let him finish out his little spiel here because uh, you guys should uh, try to support him if you are looking to learn more about uh, the faith, learn, looking to learn more about the Bible, looking to try to figure out what some of this evil is uh, going on in the world today, why it's so profound. Um, he's He's bringing up a lot of videos that show just that while he also explains what the Bible has to say about some of these things. So it's, um, I found it to be a pretty good channel. Biblical truth, just subscribe and watch these videos until the end, which will help the YouTube algorithm recommend these videos to more yeah, people. Do that for I'm us committed well. to using the skills and... Uh, feel free to like and subscribe to this channel also, if you wouldn't mind doing that. We're going to jump over to uh, another video here that uh, is... Uh, talking about a, slight, a slightly different subject. We're actually talking about the book of Enoch. This channel, though, I really do enjoy this channel a, a lot. It's called Off the Curb Ministries. I like the way the guy speaks. My wife, she told me she doesn't really like the way the guy speaks, but he has great messages. Uh, it's just the cadence of his voice is... Um, she just, didn't, just doesn't like the cadence of his voice, I guess. But, uh, you know... People aren't going to like the cadence of my voice, I guess, either, <laughs> or my southern accent. One of the, one of the two. But uh, anyway, here's off the curb ministries. The name of this video is uh, "We Were Never Supposed to See These Fallen Angels." Now, the interesting thing about the Book of Enoch, which uh, which he'll talk about here, is that uh, Enoch is actually a person mentioned in the Bible itself. Enoch is said to have lived uh, a little over 300 years, uh, and then he was taken up uh, on a chariot of fire into heaven. Was he the chariot of fire one? No, actually, that was, uh, that was Elijah. So this Enoch, was. it just says that he was, uh, that God took him, I think is how it says it in the Bible. But there's not a lot said about e, uh, Enoch other than that. Um, I do believe he is quoted uh, in the book of Jude, or one of the books at the end. I believe it's Jude, towards the end of the Bible. Um, either way, he uh, there's, we, we don't know a lot about Enoch uh, as far as the Bible is concerned. He's mentioned a few times throughout Scripture, but... Um, there's a whole book called the book of Enoch. It didn't make the Bible. It's not part of the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. Um, I'm sure God has a, and, and off the curb here is going to talk about it, but um, I'm sure God has a reason for that. I don't uh, know for sure, but that, that's kind of what he's talking about in this video is should we give, should we be lending credence to the book of Enoch? Um, I've personally not read the book of Enoch. I've, I've read pieces of it parts of it, but I've not read the whole thing. Um, 
I do find that some of it to be pretty fascinating. It kind of fills in some blanks, some gaps uh, that you uh, that you hear about in the Bible. Like it talks a lot about angels. It talks a lot about uh, the, where the angels come from, like what the angels' whole part in the Bible, you know, was all about, I guess. Um, but I've heard that some of it kind of goes off topic or I, I don't know. Anyway, we'll, we'll hear what he has to say about it. Um, if you guys have any opinions on the book of Enoch, if you've read it, if you haven't read it, whatever, please, Hey, leave me a, leave me a comment. Should I read it? Should I, should I sit down and read it and go through it and then maybe talk about it on another episode? Let me know. I'll be happy to, uh, anyway, back to our freaky Friday video, Friday the 13th, by the way, what a crazy day to do this video. So anyway, we're going to jump right into this. We were never supposed to see these fallen angels. Thousands of people claim that this book should never have been banned from the Bible, whilst others claim it should never be opened again. So who's actually right? Well, before I give you my controversial answer, first, let's investigate what is the Book of Enoch all about. 365 is how many days there are in a year, and at the end of those days, we get a new beginning. Well, so it was with Enoch. He lived 365 years, and then after that, he got his new beginning, because he was taken up to be with the Lord. And no Christian will ever dispute this fact with you. But the book of Enoch goes into exceptional detail of what happened once Enoch was taken up. And know this, as I share this information, remember, I'm not sharing this as total fact. I'm just repeating the information from the book of Enoch. It was an ordinary night, just like any other, when a bright ball of light appeared above Enoch's village. All the villagers were afraid, but Enoch wasn't. And suddenly, he found himself being carried up to heaven by an angel called Uriel. Whilst in heaven, the book of Enoch states that God told Enoch to scribe and to write down all of these important things that he was about to be shown. He was shown the mountains, he saw all the rivers of the world, and then the angel Uriel took Enoch on a tour of the universe. He saw how celestial beings could be transported. He sees the solar system, he sees the lunar cycle, he sees how the length of the Earth's orbital cycle is 365 days. And this is the reason why many people believe that the Book of Enoch must carry a certain weight about it, because most of these scientific discoveries had not yet been found when the book was written in 300. BCE. But hey now, you mustn't forget that there are actually two massive inconsistencies in the book of Enoch which would actually contradict the Bible. And before I reveal those two things to you, well, first, let's look at what this book is really famous for. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we read this. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. I wonder now, how many of you were around three years ago when I made this video about why I believe the Bible teaches that there were these angelic beings, and these angelic beings looked down from heaven, and they saw that the women of earth were very beautiful. So they went in, and they had relationships with these women, and from these relationships came these children who were part man part angel, these hybrid beings that were Goliath-like in size. And when the Lord God saw all of these evil ways, he was very angry, and he poured out his judgment, his water, on all of the earth, on everyone, except for Noah and his family, who sought salvation in the ark. I can hear exactly what you're saying right now. You're saying, Joe, how can this be possible? Didn't Jesus Christ himself say that in heaven, we will be like the angels, we will not be given to marriage. You're right, Christ did say that. And one day, in the not so distant future, my plan is to do a deep dive on the subject of giants. So if you want to see that video in a couple of weeks time, please do make sure you subscribe. But right now, watch this, because the Book of Enoch offers a very detailed account of where giants came from. And I want to hear from you. I want you to listen to this account and you tell me whether you think it's accurate or not. According to the Book of Enoch, 
God set over the earth certain angels to watch over it, to look after it. Some of these angels were good, but others were bad. And just like the biblical account, some of these bad angels, these celestial beings, they were attracted to the women of earth. And so these angels went down and they messed up the DNA of mankind. In fact, the book of Enoch raises the bar. It says the reason that these angels were attracted to the women is because they had long flowing hair. And some people take this detail and they believe that's what Paul was doing when he was instructing women to cover their hair whilst praying. Personally, I find that very questionable. But here's the big difference. In the book of Enoch, we are told that the angels had a leader, they had a boss, and he was called Shemi Hazar. And he was a rather a sly kind of guy. He said, I am really afraid that you guys will back out of what we've agreed to do, and I will be the only angel who gets in trouble with God. So let's make a deal. Let's all bind an oath that we will do this act. And there, with his persuasive words, he convinced 199 angels to fall from heaven and meet him on Mount Hernan. And that is where they begun searching out their targets to create chaos on the earth. What goes through your mind as I tell you this, that here we have... Well, what goes through my mind, if I'm being honest, is that uh, there's a lot of people that believe that the alien phenomenon, the UFOs and all of that stuff, is absolutely told about right here in the Holy Bible and in books like the book of Enoch. Uh, Enoch, the book of Enoch speaks about a race of angels, I believe, or so I've been told, a race of angels called the Anunnaki, which some of you may have heard a lot about if you were following any of these conspiracy channels. And, uh, you know, we talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that on another, on another episode. But essentially what it boils down to is that aliens are visiting the earth. Uh, UFOs are being sighted, right? We're seeing this. Our government's even talking about this now. But could it be that these aliens and these these UFOs and this kind of stuff isn't isn't aliens or UFOs at all? It's just it, but they're actually angelic beings that uh, were created by God and that have rebelled. Some of which have rebelled against God. Some of which are still fighting on the side of good. These uh, powers and spirits from an unseen realm. I don't know. I'm just saying it's something to consider. And the book of Enoch apparently gives a lot of insight into this stuff. Uh, the giants and the, the uh, Nephilim that he speaks about, the, all, of, all of that. Uh, there's people that speculate that that is that those uh, beings, as well as the angels that were uh, here conversing with men and teaching men these uh, practices, everything from metalwork to war to, I mean, just everything, everything, all the science stuff that's been taught that we uh, the mainstream science of today being guided by the hands of aliens or possibly angels uh, could just be uh, the, the, what's, what's being spoken about here in Enoch. And if that is the case, man, it really makes you wonder, it really makes you wonder what we, what we're dealing with and what we're fighting is. In fact, some of the old uh, civilizations and the, gods and goddesses that they worshipped, the, uh, the, the demigods even, like Hercules, for instance, or the Greek gods and goddesses that were, that were worshipped, the Egyptian gods. Uh, the Bible tells us that God himself fashioned these plagues to put to shame their gods, their little g gods. Well, those little g gods, is it possible that they were these angels that come down from uh, from heaven to bring chaos to the earth. I don't know. I'm just saying it's things to think about. Let's hear more what he's got to say here. Have these angelic beings who fell from heaven. They saw that the women were beautiful. They went in and from these relationships, these women gave birth to these hybrid Goliath-like creatures. And then suddenly we now have Hercules? giant clans all across the earth who are spreading evil. I wonder what you're thinking about right now. Well, it gets even crazier. One of these bad angels was called Azazel. And he is the one who taught the 
people how to fashion the metals of earth. He taught them how to create shields, armour and swords. And believers in the Book of Enoch claim that Azazel is the reason why we have fighting between countries today. Because he is the one who taught us how to hate. He is the one who taught us to create these advanced technologies and to do these things to one another. So, just remember that name, Azazel, because we're going to return to it a little bit later. I did say to you that I was going to show you the two unbiblical errors that the Book of Enoch teaches. Well, it's not just time for that right now, but there is a third one that I do want to draw your attention to. Where do we as Christians believe that sin came from? We believe that Adam and Eve, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when our first father, Adam, sinned, that is why you and I now sin. That is why you and I now do wrong. But the book of Enoch doesn't teach that. The book of Enoch would really imply that sin was learned by these fallen angels. As well as Azazel, there was another angel called Sem Yazar. And he, according to the book of Enoch, taught the people of earth how to do magic. Then we have the angels Kokobiel, Ezekiel, Arakil, Shamsil, and Sariel. And these all taught the signs of the earth, the sun, the moon, the clouds. And according again to the book of Enoch, not the Bible, apparently God said to these angels, you must never share this knowledge. It's forbidden. But these angelic beings ignored the advice or the commands of God. And again, this is only according to the book of Enoch. The fallen angels had succeeded. The earth was now populated with giants. And these giants were doing unthinkable things. They were making a total mess of God's creation. And on top of that, the... To be fair, even the serpent in the garden that misled Eve and Adam uh, essentially called God a liar in the garden. She said, God said, we can't eat from this tree. And the serpent said, you won't, or, or else we'll die. And, and, and uh, the serpent said, you won't die. You won't die. You won't die. God just doesn't want you to be like him. So this, whatever this serpent was, most likely a fallen angel or an angel of some sort said that it's highly suggested that it's uh, Lucifer, the light bringer or the, or the morning star or whatever it is. Yeah. Anyway. So I guess sin was already a thing, but introduced into man through, uh, through the sins of Adam. Fallen angels had also completed their goal in teaching men and women idolatry. Because now the humans of earth, they were also doing unspeakable things. They were copying the angelic beings, meaning that anything evil that entered into their mind that they wanted to do, they did it. So here's my question for you. As you take all of that into your mind, do you think the book of Enoch should be avoided or honored? Well, we're gonna talk about that very soon. In our story, we then meet a handful of men and women who were broken by what these giants had done. They were afraid of them. They did not like the angelic beings. And so what did they do? They cried out to the only one who could help them. They cried out to God. And the book of Enoch says that the Lord God answered their cry. This ancient text then goes on to say that God called four of his archangels and called them to act immediately. Firstly, he sent the angel Uriel to go and warn Noah to build an ark. Why? Because God was about to flood all of the earth, to wash away all of this sin, and anyone who hid inside of the ark would be safe. Secondly, God sent his archangel Raphael to lock who? Azazel away in darkness. Do you remember how I told you I was going to come back to the angel who taught men and women to do bad things with metal? He taught them how to fight. Well, the book of Enoch says that Raphael will bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him in a desert called Judeal. And it says that when he's cast into this desert, he will be covered in total darkness, so his face will never see the light again. Now, here's an interesting theory that people who believe in the book of Enoch propose. They say because Azazel was the angel who taught men and women how to fight, and because it says that Judeal is located to the east of Jerusalem, there is a river which also is in that area. What is that river called? 
the Euphrates. And we know that when the Euphrates River, when it dries up, there are four fallen angels who are bound at the bottom of the Euphrates. And when it dries up, those angels will be released. And that's not all. When this, this flesh, river guys, finally dries up, 200 up million right people now. will begin marching to fight for a big, big showdown in Megiddo. So the theory that those who believe in the Book of Enoch put forward is this. If Azazel is the angel who taught men and women to fight, would it be possible that he could be one of these four fallen angels waiting for the river Euphrates to dry up? It's just a theory, but it is worth mentioning at this point in the video. Thirdly, the Book of Enoch states Look at that. that God how much then it's dried sent up out just four his years. archangel That's Gabriel crazy. to, if you like, delete we might be living all in the of the giants I don't know. all of is their that, sons off the face the of the earth. And then fourthly, I think if you're it not is thinking said that, that already, God sent the that we may be living in the end times. Well, well, we'll read a little piece of scripture here in a little bit and see what that has to say about the end times. Archangel Michael out to deal with the boss, the king of the fallen angels. Can you remember his name? Shemi Hazar. And he too was locked away in a place described as total gloomy darkness. Guys, can I just be a little bit transparent with you? I'm literally just about to tell you on whether we should avoid the Book of Enoch or whether we should honor it and read it. But I do want to just say this, what makes this so confusing, and we're gonna to come to this in more detail, is there is truth in the Book of Enoch, but then there's also many things that are not in the Bible. And right now we've seen something that is very similar to what the scripture talks about. In Revelation 9, it talks about the abyss, and inside of the abyss, are supernatural beings. And I personally believe that as the earth winds down in the final moments, as Revelation 9 says, the abyss will be opened and these bad, evil, supernatural beings will be released on earth. And those people who are still alive will see unthinkable things, things that aren't even worth thinking about right now. Okay, the first huge error is the book of Enoch claims that you can pray to Enoch himself. Noah in the book of Enoch is described as having an almost angelic appearance. As he was born, his hair was as white as wool and his skin glowed like the sun. And unusually, the book claims that Noah could speak perfectly even though he was just a newborn baby. Now please, everyone look at me because I really do want to re-emphasize this vital point. The problem with the book of Enoch is it takes biblical truths and then it mixes it in with what would seem to be absolute total fiction. For instance, we know in the scripture that Noah's father was called Methuselah. That is biblical fact. And we know that Methuselah's dad was called Enoch. So in other words, Noah's grandfather was Enoch. So that is in the scripture. But then what does the book of Enoch do? Well, it turns it into an error. Listen, the book of Enoch says that Methuselah, because he looked at Noah's appearance and he was so perplexed by how unusual it was, he then decided to pray to his dad, Enoch, in heaven. And Enoch apparently said, hey, don't worry about it. Instead of calling your son Lamech, change his name to Noah. And don't worry because God is going to do something new on the earth. He's going to bring judgment, but Noah and his family will be saved. Well, again, Again, there's a truth there. Noah and his family were saved. God did bring judgment on earth. But what's all this about praying to Enoch? Nowhere in the Bible do we ever see any of the characters in scripture pray to someone else in heaven who is not the Lord God. The Bible could not put it any clearer than this. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Yeah, take note, Catholics. Uh... You can pray to God. I don't know what you're praying to all these other people for. Just saying. Man. Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator. There is only one middleman. There is only one bridge by which we can get to heaven. And that is through the God man, Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus said, I and the Father are one. In other words, I am God in a flesh. I am God in a skin. And he is the only one we can turn to. Not Enoch, not Moses, not any other saint in heaven. We can only turn to the Lord Jesus Christ because 
because he alone is the mediator for us. But I'm not going to lie to you, things are about to get a lot worse. In chapter 48 of the book of Enoch 3, it says that Enoch transformed from a man into an angel called Metatron. And what is particularly wrong about this teaching is that it led others, including the famous rabbi Elisha Ben, to claim that Enoch was a lesser Yahweh, and that actually there were two great powers in heaven, God and Metatron, or God and Enoch. Okay, here is the second biggest error of the book of Enoch. I want you to imagine that a man or woman who has zero knowledge of the Bible picks up the book of Enoch. Do you know what conclusion they come to? Pretty much they would be given the impression that salvation can only be achieved by knowledge, by being righteous, and by keeping the words of the book of Enoch. However, we know that when we read the Bible, we can never get to heaven by being righteous. For the Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And the book of Enoch literally says, and for all of you sinners, there shall be no salvation. Well, everyone now take a deep breath because the Bible says something completely different. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. In other words, the man who wrote this, the Apostle Paul, though he had written many scriptures, though he had done many mighty, if you like, righteous acts for the Lord God, he was saying, I am the chief of sinners. I'm nothing more than a rotten sinner at heart. And do you know what? Is there anyone listening to my voice right now that can hold up their hand and say, I too am the chief of sinners? If that's you, well, the good news is this. There are only two types of people that get into heaven. Perfect people and forgiven people. Again, I'll ask you, can you raise your hand, anyone listening to me right now, and say, I am perfect? You can't because there is none that is righteous. No, not even one. We all fail God. Even our thought life, the acts we do, even when we're not even trying to sin, we sin. We make such a mess every single day. And if the books are opened and everyone can see our sin in our lives, everyone would be able to agree with us that we are truly worse than we actually think we are. But the wonderful news is this. Christ Jesus loves sinners. Christ Jesus offers salvation to sinners. He came into the world to save sinners like you and me. And it works like this. On an old wooden cross 2,000 years ago, the worst of me, all of my sin was placed on the Lord Jesus Christ. All of your sin was laid on him. And there God the Father crushed him. There God the Father poured out all of his judgment for our sin on Jesus so that you and I can be forgiven so that you and I can have our sins washed away, ripped up, gone, buried at the bottom of the ocean so that we can now have a fresh start, a new beginning. Just like we've talked about with Noah, how Noah was instructed to get onto the ark, to hide himself in the ark for safety. So you and I, we have an ark, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can hide behind him and have total safety because Jesus Christ died for our sins. He rose from the dead, meaning he can conquer death and sin and today he's ascended on the right hand of the Father and we go to him. No other man we go to Christ. When you want to pray and ask for forgiveness right now if you do, you go to Christ. You don't go to a priest, you don't go to a pastor you don't go to any religious figure you go to the God man Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is enough. And the only question I need to ask you right now is will you do it? Will you? So very well done. Very well said. Off the curb ministries, guys, go check that one out. Um, yeah, we're, we are definitely living in some difficult times, living in times when there is no fear of God in the eyes of the people. Not no, There's no fear of God in the eyes of our leaders. It's just a, a very scary time. The Euphrates is drying up, guys. It's drying up right now. Won't be long now. Let's take a look here what God says about uh, the people of the world. God's wrath upon the righteous. Uh, here we go. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is in the book of Romans. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they know they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and in their foolish and their foolish hearts were darkened. goes on to say that uh, in their uh, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped the and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this reason god gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. They celebrate as they invent new ways to sin, guys. We're seeing that in the world today. But do not fear, for God has a plan. God loves us. He sent his only son, Jesus, to die for our sins, that we would have a way out, that we would have a way to be forgiven, to be reconciled unto the Father. All we do have to do is call upon his name. We're saved through faith and righteous, through his righteousness. The Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, through faith. It says, by grace, you have been saved and raised and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Guys, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Walk in his righteousness. Follow him. And all of this evil can melt away. Do it soon because I do. Like I said, I mean, it feels like we're living in the end times. And if ever there was a time to, to be vigilant and paying attention and looking for the coming of the uh, the second coming of Christ, it's now. It is it is now. There's no time to delay anymore. If you've been putting it off and putting it off, don't put it off, man. It ain't it ain't it ain't time left. The world is literally writhing in birth birthing pains, labor pains, 
And it's about to give birth to the end, the end times. Guys, I love you. I thank you for listening to this. If you've stuck in here this long, I hope you have. This was some pretty good messages by both of these channels here. That's Off the Curb Ministries for the first one. And Mike, uh, the other one was Mike, the uh, Mike Joyful Exile is the name of the channel. Uh, you guys should go check out both of those channels. They're very good. Uh, put together some really good stuff uh, worth sharing, worth listening to. Um, I hope you found some uh, insight here today. I hope uh, I hope you'll consider my words, the words of these men, but most especially, guys, consider the words of the Holy Bible. This is your God talking to you. This is how He speaks to you. This is how He tells you His plans. How He tells you what is good and what is not. What is what is right and what is wrong. What is what is real. What is truth? In a world full of lies, we don't have a lot of truth. But this right here is the source. This is where the truth comes from. It comes from him and he gave it to us. He gave it to us. He put it in our hands. Pick it up. Look at it. Read it. Take it to heart. Until next time, guys, we will see you on Sunday for uh, more politics. Golly, the politics in the news. I'm, it's running me ragged, but... We're gonna be uh, we're gonna be through with it here before long. I hope not through with it completely. It'll always keep going. But anyway, in the meantime, pray for our country. Pray for your neighbors. Do something kind and nice for a stranger, man. There's not enough good in the world. We will see you on Sunday, right here on the Southern Draw Podcast. Until then, be free and be blessed. Peace. Peace.